Not long ago, I accompanied my wife on a bargain-hunting bee. Our attention was attracted by a crowd of women who were elbowing each other out of the way in front of a petticoat counter at which bargains were being offered. One lady, who looked to be about forty-five years of age, crawled on her hands and knees through the crowd and bobbed up in front of a customer who had engaged the attention of the saleswoman ahead of her. In a loud, high-pitched tone of voice, she demanded attention. The saleswoman was a diplomat who understood human nature. She also possessed self-control for she smiled sweetly at the intruder and said, Yes, miss, I will be with you in a moment. The intruder calmed herself. I do not know whether it was the yes, miss, or the sweet tone in which it was said that modified her attitude. But it was one or the other, perhaps it was both. I do know, however, that the saleswoman was rewarded for her self-control by the sale of three petticoats, and the happy miss went away feeling much younger for the remark. Roast turkey is a very popular dish, but overeating it cost a friend of mine, who was in the printing business, a $50,000 order. It happened the day after Thanksgiving, when I called at his office for the purpose of introducing him to a prominent Russian who had come to the United States to publish a book. The Russian spoke broken English, and it was therefore hard for him to make himself easily understood. During the interview, he asked my printer friend a question which was mistaken as a reflection upon his ability as a printer. In an unguarded moment, he countered with this remark. The trouble with you Bolsheviks is that you look with suspicion on the remainder of the world just because of your own short-sightedness. My Bolshevik friend nudged me on the elbow and whispered, The gentleman seems to be sick. We shall call again when he is feeling better. But he never called again. He placed his order with another printer, and I learned afterward that the profit on that order was more than $10,000. Ten thousand dollars seems a high price to pay for a plate of turkey, but that is the price that it cost my printer friend, for he offered me an apology for his conduct on the ground that his turkey dinner had given him indigestion, and therefore he had lost his self-control. One of the largest chain store concerns in the world has adopted a unique, though effective, method of employing salespeople who have developed the essential quality of self-control, which all successful salespeople must possess. This concern has in its employ a very clever woman who visits department stores and other places where salespeople are employed and selects certain ones whom she believes to possess tact and self-control. But to be sure of her judgment, she approaches these salesmen and has them show her their wares. She asks all sorts of questions that are designed to try their patience. If they stand the test, they are offered better positions. If they fail in the test, they have merely allowed a good opportunity to pass by without knowing it. No doubt all people who refuse or neglect to exercise self-control are literally turning opportunity after opportunity away without knowing it. One day I was standing at the glove counter of a large retail store talking to a young man who was employed there. He was telling me that he had been with the store four years, but on account of the short-sightedness of the store, his services had not been appreciated, and he was looking for another position. In the midst of this conversation, a customer walked up to him and asked to see some hats. He paid no attention to the customer's inquiry until he had finished telling me his troubles, despite the fact that the customer was obviously becoming impatient. Finally, he returned to the customer and said, This isn't the hat department. When the customer inquired as to where he might find that department, the young man replied, Ask the floor walker over there. He will direct you. For four years, this young man had been standing on top of a fine opportunity, but he did not know it. He could have made a friend of every person whom he served in that store, and these friends could have made him one of the most valuable men in the store, because they would have come back to trade with him. Snappy answers to inquiring customers do not bring them back. One rainy afternoon, an old lady walked into a Pittsburgh department store and wandered around in an aimless sort of way, very much in the manner that people who have no intention of buying often do. Most of the salespeople gave her the once-over and busied themselves by straightening the stock on their shelves, so as to avoid being troubled by her. One of the young men saw her and made it his business to inquire politely if he might serve her. She informed him that she was only waiting for it to stop raining, that she did not wish to make any purchases. The young man assured her that she was welcome, and by engaging her in conversation made her feel that he had meant what he said. When she was ready to go, he accompanied her to the street and raised her umbrella for her. She asked for his card and went on her way. The incident had been forgotten by the young man when, one day, he was called into the office by the head of the firm, 
and shown a letter from a lady who wanted a salesman to go to Scotland and take an order for the furnishings for a mansion. That lady was Andrew Carnegie's mother. She was also the same woman whom the young man had so courteously escorted to the street many months previously. In the letter, Mrs. Carnegie specified that this young man was the one whom she desired to be sent to take her order. That order amounted to an enormous sum, and the incident brought the young man an opportunity for advancement that he might never have had, except for his courtesy to an old lady who did not look like a ready sale. Just as the great fundamental laws of life are wrapped up in the commonest sort of everyday experiences that most of us never notice, so are the real opportunities often hidden in the seemingly unimportant transactions of life. Ask the next ten people whom you meet why they have not accomplished more in their respective lines of endeavor, and at least nine of them will tell you that opportunity does not seem to come around their way. Go a step further and analyze each of these nine accurately by observing their actions for one single day, and the chances are that you will find that every one of them is turning away the finest sort of opportunities every hour of the day. One day I went to visit a friend who was associated with a commercial school in the capacity of solicitor. When I asked him how he was getting along, he replied, Rotten. I see a large number of people, but I'm not making enough sales to give me a good living. In fact, my account with the school is overdrawn, and I am thinking about changing positions as there is no opportunity here. It happened that I was on my vacation and had ten days' time that I could use as I wished, so I challenged his remark that he had no opportunity by telling him that I could turn his position into $250 in a week's time and show him how to make it worth that every week thereafter. He looked at me in amazement and asked me not to joke with him over so serious a matter. When he was finally convinced that I was in earnest, he ventured to inquire how I would perform the miracle. Then I asked him if he had ever heard of organized effort, to which he replied, What do you mean by organized effort? I informed him that I had reference to the direction of his efforts in such a manner that he would enroll from five to ten students with the same amount of effort that he had been putting into the enrollment of one or of none. He said he was willing to be shown, so I gave him instructions to arrange for me to speak before the employees of one of the local department stores. He made the appointment, and I delivered the address. In my talk, I outlined a plan through which the employees could not only increase their ability so that they could earn more money in their present positions, but it also offered them an opportunity to prepare themselves for greater responsibilities and better positions. Following my talk, which of course was designed for that purpose, my friend enrolled eight of those employees for night courses in the commercial school which he represented. The following night he booked me for a similar address before the employees of a laundry, and following the address he enrolled three more students, two of them young women who worked over the washing machines at the hardest sort of labor. Two days later he booked me for an address before the employees of one of the local banks, and following the address he enrolled four more students, making a total of fifteen students, and the entire time consumed was not more than six hours, including the time required for the delivery of the addresses and the enrollment of the students. My friend's commission on the transactions was a little over four hundred dollars. These places of employment were within fifteen minutes' walk of this man's place of business, but he had never thought of looking there for business. Neither had he ever thought of allying himself with a speaker who could assist him in group selling. That man now owns a splendid commercial school of his own, and I am informed that his net income last year was over ten thousand dollars. No opportunities come your way? Perhaps they come, but you do not see them. Perhaps you will see them in the future as you are preparing yourself, through the aid of this reading course in the Law of Success, so that you can recognize an opportunity when you see it. The sixth lesson of this course is on the subject of imagination, which was the chief factor that entered into the transaction that I have just related. Imagination, plus a definite plan, plus self-confidence, plus action, were the main factors that entered into this transaction. You now know how to use all of these, and before you shall have finished this lesson, you will understand how to direct these factors through self-control. The man who actually knows just what he wants in life has already gone a long way toward attaining it. No man can rise to fame and fortune without carrying others along with him. It simply cannot be done. Fear no man, hate no man, wish no one misfortune, and more than likely, you will have plenty of friends.
Now, let us examine the scope of meaning of the term self-control as it is used in connection with this course by describing the general conduct of a person who possesses it. A person with well-developed self-control does not indulge in hatred, envy, jealousy, fear, revenge, or any similar destructive emotions. A person with well-developed self-control does not go into ecstasies or become ungovernably enthusiastic over anything or anybody. Greed and selfishness and self-approval beyond the point of accurate self-analysis and appreciation of one's actual merits indicate lack of self-control in one of its most dangerous forms. Self-confidence is one of the important essentials of success, but when this faculty is developed beyond the point of reason, it becomes very dangerous. Self-sacrifice is a commendable quality, but when it is carried to extremes, it also becomes one of the dangerous forms of lack of self-control. You owe it to yourself not to permit your emotions to place your happiness in the keeping of another person. Love is essential for happiness, but the person who loves so deeply that his or her happiness is placed entirely in the hands of another resembles the little lamb who crept into the den of the nice, gentle little wolf and begged to be permitted to lie down and go to sleep, or the canary bird that persisted in playing with the cat's whiskers. A person with well-developed self-control will not permit himself to be influenced by the cynic or the pessimist, nor will he permit another person to do his thinking for him. A person with well-developed self-control will stimulate his imagination and his enthusiasm until they have produced action, but he will then control that action and not permit it to control him. A person with well-developed self-control will never, under any circumstances, slander another person or seek revenge for any cause whatsoever. A person with self-control will not hate those who do not agree with him. Instead, he will endeavor to understand the reason for their disagreement and profit by it. We come now to a form of lack of self-control which causes more grief than all other forms combined. It is the habit of forming opinions before studying the facts. We will not analyze this particular form in detail in this lesson for the reason that it is fully covered in Lesson 11 on accurate thought. But the subject of self-control could not be covered without at least a passing reference to this common evil to which we are all more or less addicted. No one has any right to form an opinion that is not based either upon that which he believes to be facts or upon a reasonable hypothesis. Yet, if you will observe yourself carefully, you will catch yourself forming opinions on nothing more substantial than your desire for a thing to be or not to be.